Welcome to NTD News. I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. President Biden says he plans to visit the border and he knows the situation at the facilities. But what's his plan to stop people from coming? The Arizona State Senate announces a hand recount in Maricopa County. The Senate president says there will be a broad and detailed audit of the controversial 2020 election. We'll bring you the details. Federal prosecutors in North Carolina announced charges in a voting fraud investigation. The charges involve voter registration by non-U.S. citizens. Prosecutors sought more records, but the state's Democrat attorney general blocked them. And a group of Cuban Americans are calling on Biden to keep up Trump-era sanctions on the communist regime. They say the financial pressure is the only way to establish human rights there. And former President Trump is coming back to social media. But which platform will he be using? All that and more on NTD News. President Biden says he does plan to eventually visit the border. Yesterday, he also told reporters he knows what's going on in border facilities. President Biden said Sunday he plans to visit the U.S.-Mexico border sometime. Are you thinking of going to the border? At some point, I will, yes. The U.S. faces a surge in illegal border crossings. It comes after Biden reversed several Trump-era immigration policies, including Trump's efforts to end the catch-and-release policy. One reporter asked Biden what more can be done to keep migrants from coming. A lot more. We're in the process of doing it now, including making sure that we reestablish what existed before, which was they can stay in place and make their case from their home country. The DHS secretary told NBC News Sunday they're expelling families and single adults, but not children. In this video taken Saturday night, You see busloads of migrants arriving at a convention center in Dallas, where they're being housed. Uh, We are working around the clock to move those children out of the Border Patrol facilities into the care and custody of the Department of Health and Human Services uh, that shelters them. On Sunday, Mallorca seemed to shift blame for the current crisis to the Trump administration. Trump appeared to respond, writing, We proudly handed the Biden administration the most secure border in history. All they had to do was keep this smooth-running system on autopilot. Trump also raised concerns about reviving catch and release. He writes, Even someone of Mallorca's limited abilities should understand that if you provide catch and release to the world's illegal aliens, then the whole world will come. Members of the media are also raising concerns about a lack of transparency. One photographer tweeted, I respectfully ask U.S. Customs and Border Protection to stop blocking media access to their border operations. I photographed CPB under Bush, Obama, and Trump, but now zero access is granted to media. Last month, Border Patrol apprehended over 100,000 illegal border crossers. That's almost triple the amount from the year before. And new photos inside the temporary overflow facilities in Texas have just been released. Project Veritas and Axios both show images of the crowded makeshift facilities. According to recent reports, there are eight pods in these facilities. Project Veritas's James O'Keefe says these photos were taken in the last few days and claims 50 people were positive with the virus over the last few days. NTD was unable to independently verify these claims. Democratic Representative Henry Cuellar told Axios that as of Sunday, one pod held more than 400 unaccompanied male minors. He describes the situation as terrible conditions for the children and says Border Patrol isn't equipped to care for the children. The Arizona State Senate says they will do a hand recount and forensic audit of the 2020 election in Maricopa County. Witnesses say there was voting fraud and abuses during the election there. Arizona State Senate President Karen Fan sent out an announcement about the recount. It says there will be a broad and detailed forensic audit. There will be a hand recount, voting machines will be tested, and IT breaches will be investigated. The announcement says that the legislators reached out to the best and brightest experts around the country, and they have identified a preferred audit team. It says that voters want a complete investigation so they can trust elections. The Senate issued subpoenas following the 2020 election. Maricopa County officials argued that they did not have to comply with them. The judge ruled in favor of the Senate, paving the way for the audit. His ruling states that Arizona legislator clearly has the power to investigate and examine election reform matters. He says they can also subpoena equipment such as voting machines. The Senate announcement says they want to work with county officials. 
It says they want a transparent and bipartisan process, and says they're working out final details and hope to announce the start of the audit soon. Commissioners in one Michigan county unanimously vote to hand count every ballot cast in the upcoming May 4th primary. The decision avoids the use of Dominion Voting Systems machines in Antrim County amid an ongoing election fraud case. Commissioners say they're concerned using the machines would violate a judge's order in the case. The move to hand count ballots this time is the alternative to buying around $150,000 in new election machines. The county now has to wait to see if the state will accept hand counted ballots or if it will force the county to count votes another way. Federal prosecutors charged 24 people with voting fraud in North Carolina. The Trump-appointed U.S. attorney on the case wanted more records, but the state's Democrat attorney general strictly limited his request. Federal prosecutors announced charges against 24 people for voting fraud in North Carolina. Each case involves a non-U.S. citizen presenting false information to register to vote. U.S. Attorney Robert Higdon aggressively pursued illegal voting cases. He subpoenaed election records from North Carolina officials. State officials advised Democrat Attorney General Josh Stein to quash the subpoena. They said the record's request was too broad. Stein ordered a small fraction of the records turned over. Higdon says the right to vote is a precious privilege available only to citizens of the United States. He also pointed out that when people vote illegally, it dilutes the legitimate votes. Higdon resigned last month at the request of President Biden. Biden asked all U.S. attorneys that Trump had appointed to resign. A number of non-citizens say they were not aware that they weren't actually allowed to vote. Evidence from the investigation shows people conducting voter registration drives deceived the non-citizens. Those charged faced jail time and fines of up to $350,000 if convicted. Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson revealed the deeper purpose of his state's near-total abortion ban. He signed it into law earlier this month to set the stage for something bigger. Uh, I signed it because it is a direct challenge to Roe versus Wade. That was the intent of it. I think there's a very narrow chance that the Supreme Court will accept that case, but we'll see. The Arkansas Unborn Child Protection Act bans providers from performing abortions except to save the life of a pregnant woman in an emergency. Violators risk up to $100,000 in fines and 10 years imprisonment. Lawmakers indicated that the intent of the law is to allow the Supreme Court to correct earlier decisions permitting abortion. Hutchinson said the bill received overwhelming support, but he would have preferred if it provided exceptions for rape and incest. The outer fencing surrounding the U.S. Capitol started coming down this weekend. It was set up following the January 6th breach. For the first time in nearly three months, joggers, bicyclists, and tourists are once again able to use some of the green space. National Guardsmen began the removal process this weekend. By Sunday, much of the black fencing had been taken down. Some of the streets around the Capitol complex also reopened to traffic this weekend. A memo sent to Capitol staff said the changes are being made because there's no longer a credible threat against Congress. Capitol Police say plans could change if officials learn of any new threats. Congressional leaders are currently discussing a new $2 billion plan to improve security around the Capitol. Well, it looks like former President Trump is going to return to social media, and his advisor says it'll be on a platform of his own. Let's take a look. Trump spokesman Jason Miller told Fox News former President Trump will launch his own social media platform in two to three months. This is something that I think will be the, the hottest ticket in social media. It's going to completely redefine the game and everybody is going to be waiting and watching to see what exactly President uh, Trump does, but it will be his own platform. And this is how Trump, famous for his tweets, will make his return to social media. Twitter banned Trump in January. He had about 90 million followers at the time. Miller did not say what the name of the company will be, but he said a lot of companies have approached the former president to make it happen. Several social media companies silenced Trump following the breach of the Capitol on January 6th, including Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Snapchat. Trump hasn't said whether he will return to other platforms conservatives favor, such as Gab, MeWe, or Parler. Last month, Trump speculated in an interview with Newsmax that Parler couldn't mechanically handle the number of users he would bring. And recently, Trump said he hasn't decided whether he will run for president in 2024. His first priority is to see what he can do with the House. 
The adviser said Trump will make endorsements for Republican challengers in the 2022 primaries. He said over 20 senators and 50 Congress members have called or visited Trump at Mar-a-Lago seeking his endorsement, one that Miller calls the most important political endorsement in world history. Miller said to pay attention to Georgia on Monday, March 22nd, because Trump is about to make a big endorsement. Reports reveal top Biden administration officials had previously unknown ties to tech giants. That includes the current national security advisor, who has multiple links to Microsoft. Filings with the Office of Government Ethics show National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan served on an advisory council for Microsoft from 2017 through last year. Sullivan holds between $50,000 and $100,000 of stock in both Microsoft and Google's parent company, Alphabet. He also owns between $15,000 and $50,000 of Facebook stock. An official said Sullivan is currently divesting all of his stock holdings. Sullivan is overseeing the government's response to January's cyber attack on Microsoft's Exchange email software. And White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki was paid at least $5,000 as a communications consultant for Lyft. The disclosures were first reported by the Associated Press. A Democratic congressman is preparing multiple bills to fight big tech monopolies. Congressman David Siciliani told Axios big tech has a lot of money and lobbying staff in Washington ready to confront any challenge. He says the thinking in Washington favors big tech and that companies will fight to keep it that way. Here's, he's, so he's come up with a way to break the status quo. Instead of big anti-tech law, he, antitrust law, he's aiming for 10 or more smaller bills which he says will be ready by May. Smaller, more targeted legislation will gain bipartisan support more easily and will make it harder for big tech to respond. A group of Cuban Americans from across the nation gathered in front of the White House over the weekend to peacefully protest for human rights in Cuba. They want Biden to keep Trump era sanctions on the regime in place and put human rights before business. NTD's Melina Weiskopf has the story. Here in front of the White House today, a large group of Cuban Americans came out to send a message to Joe Biden, urging him to keep the sanctions on the Cuban government. They're urging him not to do business with the Cuban regime until they put an end to their human rights abuses. Many of the attendees here tell us that they're here as an effort to liberate their family members who are still suffering under the Cuban communist regime. My father has been in jail several times just for doing journalism. So that that you are doing right here today, your job, freely, my father has been able to do it. People in Cuba are not, not even able to record what's going on in the streets without going to jail. The Cuban community struggled for many years. It's been more than 60 years that they're struggling under a communism government. The Trump administration sanctioned the island's totalitarian government to pressure Cuban officials to make changes. This group of activists is telling President Biden to do the same. But if they go back and they do what the Obama administration do, we're going to have more more gear about that deterioration. The people of Cuba, they need more than money. They need more than business. They need freedom. Right now, several senators are pushing for Biden to lift the Trump era sanctions. The attendees here say they oppose that approach because it didn't work before. The last time they actually negotiated with the government, the the human rights were not uh, not established at all. The, The government stated that they were going to establish them and they were not. She says right now the Cuban government holds 130 political prisoners of conscience and more are jailed and tortured every day just for standing up against the communist regime. Other peaceful protesters at the event warn about signs of communism manifesting in America. And say you need this, you need free medical, you need that. And you don't have to work, you don't have to do anything. They start changing their minds and it gets to a point. That's how these governments get into power. And they don't leave. Communist, socialist is is a, a lie. You know, it's a lie because it's not true. Nothing coming good from communists. And this is the first protest this group has held here in D.C. The organizer says they're going to keep holding protests like this to send a message to the world that the communist ideology shouldn't exist in Cuba or in any country in the world. Reporting in Washington D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. 
U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin made an unannounced visit to Afghanistan Sunday. His trip comes alongside the possibility of extending the U.S. presence there. Austin says he's concerned about the current level of violence there, though the Trump administration had reached a deal with the Taliban to pull out by May 1st. On Sunday, Austin met with Afghanistan's president and other officials. That's according to General Scott Miller, who heads the U.S. and United Nations forces there. During his visit, Austin refused to commit to the Trump administration's timeline for U.S. withdrawal. The Biden administration is said to be considering a six-month extension for American troops in Afghanistan as the deadline approaches. The defense secretary says it's a rigorous process to make decisions about removing troops and destroying equipment that could fall into the hands of the Taliban. Coming up, tourists trickle back onto Hollywood's Walk of Fame. Theaters are now open in L.A. County, and it's starting to look a little less like the scene of a pandemic. And a picturesque park on the border between Washington State and Canada becomes a sanctuary for people kept apart by pandemic restrictions. Find out more on NTD News. Hollywood's making a comeback. Theaters are reopening and tourists are trickling in. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story. It's starting to look a little less like a pandemic and more like spring break in Hollywood. California's COVID-19 positive tests and death rates have fallen dramatically since January, so much that some theaters have officially reopened. Abraham Morita's taking in the weather. Well, it feels awesome because you're not back at home anymore. You're able to go out and enjoy the sun, the weather, uh, be able to see other people again, I guess. The fear factor doesn't appear very strong here, but preventative measures are still in place. Los Angeles County, home to Hollywood, requires masks in work and public spaces. Rose Espinosa's played it safe, even when she didn't have to. Um, we're actually trying to keep our distance from other people um, with precautions, because I know California is one of the top places that the COVID is really high and the cases are high. But down in Texas, everything is actually open 100%. So, but we actually still wear our mask and still sanitize and everything else as well. William Turner says he's trying to live it up. I'm only here because I'm on vacation. People say Los Angeles was a, a place to be for vacation or just to go sightseeing. So I'm here to see what the hype is about. And so far I'm loving it. I'm living up to the hype. Maybe you've spent a lot of time locked up at home watching Netflix. Well, Todd Tickering was just on his way out of the El Capitan Theater. And he says the in-person experience isn't just better, it's important. For a full year of watching things in your home, it, it just isn't the same experience. The, the sound and especially a movie like this that has so much color and such a lush score. Um, it's important to see it in the theaters and support them. Most of the state's counties are still in the substantial risk category. California state health officials are taking a cautious approach to reopening. A park on the U.S.-Canada border has become a refuge for separated loved ones. There, Americans and Canadians come together in person despite the country's pandemic restrictions. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. For Reagan Steele and Rod Greenwood, the border crossing of Peace Arch Park has become a lover's lane. 41-year-old Steele lives in Marysville, Washington, located about 80 miles south of the U.S.-Canada border. Every weekend she meets Greenwood, her Canadian boyfriend of six years, at the park. If we didn't have this, we wouldn't even be able to see each other. So I'm super grateful because we can actually touch each other here and, um, you know, Many other couples that are separated don't have a luxury like this that we do. In March 2020, the U.S.-Canada border was closed due to the pandemic. In pre-pandemic times, Peace Arch Park was little more than a pit stop and a picturesque picnic spot. British Columbia closed its side of the park in June, but the American side remains open. Canadians can walk through a shallow ditch into Washington state and return without pandemic restrictions being enforced. The two weeks just makes it really impossible for a lot of people since they don't have that extra time to take off work. So hopefully we can get our families and everybody back together soon. There's no official port of entry at the park to enforce tests or quarantines. So it's become a staging ground for birthday parties, family gatherings and weddings. According to the Washington State Park Service, park visitors have more than doubled, reaching almost 140,000 in 2020. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. 
Air travel in the U.S. isn't slowing down. The Transportation Security Administration says it screened more than 1.5 million people on Sunday, a new daily record. That number beat the daily record set only two days before. It was also the 11th straight day that more than a million people were screened. But experts are still warning against travel as new variants of the virus continue to spread. And still to come, Japan makes a big announcement about the upcoming Olympics. It could drastically affect the size and reach of the games while putting the Japanese public at ease. And a herd of mountain goats move into a Welsh town with residents on lockdown. It looks like these kids are planning to settle down. Find out more in just a minute on NTD News. Amid public concerns over the CCP virus, international spectators won't be allowed to enter Japan for this summer's Olympic Games. The organizers announced this over the weekend. The ruling sets the stage for a drastically scaled back event. Here's Tokyo 2020 president Seiko Hashimoto. Based on the present situation, it's highly difficult to guarantee people from overseas will be able to enter Japan this summer. In order to give clarity to ticket holders living overseas and to enable them to adjust their travel plans at this stage, the Japanese side have come to the conclusion that they will not be able to enter into Japan at the time of the Games. Organisers say some 600,000 Olympic tickets purchased by overseas residents will be refunded, as will another 300,000 Paralympic tickets. The Olympic Games were postponed last year due to the global health crisis. While the outbreak has chilled public opinion toward the event, both organisers and Japan's Prime Minister have vowed to press ahead. Organisers say the decision will, quote, ensure safe and secure games for all participants and the Japanese public. The games are scheduled to begin on July 23rd. Media polls have shown a majority of the Japanese public were wary about letting in international spectators to watch the games as the country grapples with the tail end of a third wave of the pandemic. This year, one town in Wales was in for a surprise, an infestation of wild mountain goats. NTD's Sapphire Quarter tells us what they're doing there. I don't see why it's a problem, really, as long as they're like not harming anyone. I don't know if they're dangerous or not, but I wouldn't like to go very near to them. <laughs> Landunda, Wales' newest residents seem to think they have as much right to be there as anyone else. Hey, I was driving, they were all in the road and they just don't move. They may be trying to earn their keep by doing public works. And we've got a little bay tree, for example, and he, he comes in and he trims it, or they trim it into a nice little pom-pom for us. You know, it saves us having to do it. Great Orm wild goats normally live in the mountains, but have now started venturing into town as their numbers grow. Normally the government works to control the population. And we do that through a contraception programme, and that involves rounding them all up. It takes some effort. Lots of volunteers get together to do it and to, to look at the female goats. Because of the pandemic, it was impossible. So they have been breeding like goats. After the lockdown started, 30 goats started venturing into Londundo for food. Over time, some of the goats have gotten more daring, even appearing outside of the magistrate's court. It's thought they may return to the mountains for breeding season. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News. Let's turn our attention to health. Next, we find out what Chinese medicine has to say about alcohol. These beverages have a range of effects on the body that can be both helpful and harmful. Welcome to Strong Mind and Body, I'm Gina Marie. As a society, we have mixed feelings about alcohol. Some think it's good, some think it's bad. The ups and downs of food fads and research highlighting different aspects of alcohol make it hard to know whether alcohol is an angel or a demon. In Chinese medicine, alcohol has always been stereotyped as leaving your body damp and hot. Dampness causes you to be unable to metabolize food and fluids well, so your body gets boggy and retains pockets of water or moisture. Excess fat, edema and even athlete's foot are considered to be damp conditions. Alcohol is also considered hot, which means that the energetic end result of drinking it is that it warms you up, but it can leave you restless, irritable, dried out and too warm. However, the nature of alcohol in Chinese medicine isn't all bad. Let's start with beer. Beer is actually energetically cool. Its flavor is considered to be bitter and sweet. And while beer has the potential to be very dampening, the more bitter it is, the less dampening it actually becomes. 
Regardless of how light or dark your beer is, too much can overwhelm your spleen and kidneys and the energetic systems associated with them. This messes up your digestion and water metabolism and leaves you with dampness issues. In Chinese medicine, fat is also seen as a form of excess dampness, which is an interesting way to think of a beer belly. There is good news for beer drinkers though. Bitter, dark beers are actually considered to be slightly nourishing for your body. Let's look at wine. Wine is considered to be energetically warm, with red wine being warmer than white. Wine, like all alcoholic drinks, stimulates the movement of qi, but the light nature of wine is helpful in stimulating digestion after a heavy or rich meal. Red wine is known to have resveratrol, a powerful antioxidant. However, to reap the benefits found in wine, you would have to drink a lot. So many people resort to supplements to get enough resveratrol to affect their health. In Chinese herbal medicine, some herbs and formulas are prepared with wine to add wine's warming, sweet, sour or bitter properties to the mix. And finally, hard liquor. Spirits such as gin, vodka, scotch and tequila are a different story from beer and wine. They are very good at moving stagnation and very dispersing. Think of stagnation as your energetic engine seizing up. Spirits definitely get things moving. That said, spirits are hot and damp and too much can quickly be toxic to your body. In Chinese medicine, overconsumption of spirits stress your liver and create a great deal of heat. All alcoholic drinks are moving and dispersing in general. They loosen you up and give you a sense of well-being. However, like everything in Chinese medicine and life in general, a little is okay, but too much is overwhelming. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com.